Thanks for coming. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I really enjoyed the whole process of working through uh, my, my work, trying to put together uh, PowerPoint because it takes you to many places, uh, a lot of history. And so we're gonna start with that right now. Okay. So the piece that I had in the show is called Breakthrough. And I'm gonna make our faces smaller. Okay, got rid of that. Okay, now, oops. All right, so this is the piece that was is in the show currently. And it is my last piece. It's the one that I did uh, most recently. It's 40 by 60. It is a lot about the time that we're in right now, the kind of critical, uh, critical time of introspection and outer experiences that have really driven home a lot of reflection for myself and I think for everyone. It's like, how do we make it through this period of time where the whole world has experienced trauma and some folks undoubtedly more than others, but still there is a, a sense of that. And I, I wanted this piece to be positive too. I wanted it to also reflect that we aren't gonna get through this without some kind of transformational experience on an individual level. And I, I hope that that comes through through the color and the forms. This is the piece that really originated that idea. This is a piece that's very small compared to the other one. It's four by six inches. And what happened when COVID struck was that I couldn't go to my, my studio anymore. And I brought my watercolors gouache and my watercolor paper home and worked in a small space. I made some directives to myself. I said, I'm going to do very um, intuitive work. I'm going to do work that is positive because it felt so heavy around. And so I did this whole series and this is one of them. And of course it translates to oil paint and largeness much differently, but I think that the the idea of that transformation comes through. This is another one from that early, the series that I started early on in COVID, just playing with lines and shapes and water and the fluidity of water. A lot of times I would take uh, black ink, sumie ink and paint one day and then come back and paint with color the next after that had dried. And I often didn't use paint brushes. Uh, I worked with a yucca plant that I had chewed the end of it uh, that a Native American woman had given me in the Southwest who was painting her pottery. She, I asked her about it. She said, here, have some of these. So I brought them home and I just love the lines, the quality of the line because it's it breaks and you don't always know where it's going to go, but then there's this sort of playing off of riffing off of those lines, like, like jazz, like music, like, like, well, this happens. So this happens. This was definitely used. I used the yucca for the blue line. And I've been, I've taken Sumie painting from Shoso Sato over the years, and I really enjoy line and playing with line and using thin Japanese paintbrushes to create a line that has character. And this is the last piece that I did uh, actually two weeks ago. And again, I used the yucca plant to create the black and then going back in. And I've been experimenting since then on very large, uh, long papers that I hang on the wall just with the black uh, ink and I'm using a, a brush I got at a garage sale that's about 
10 inches wide and it's used for putting asphalt on roofs, but it just has an interesting character. When I got back in the studio, I wanted to warm up again. I wanted to get physical. I wanted to get bigger. And so this piece of paper is probably more like 23 by 30. And I put it on the floor and I used the Sumier ink again with a very large paintbrush that my son had given me so that it, there was a physicality to the movement. There was an energy that I could put back into the movement of the paint. And here's another one from that series. I also got paint all over the floor and the carpeting of my studio, but that's what they're for, really. Um, here's another one. This is one called View Through COVID. The original image that I derived this from was actually a shadow cast on the wall. And it was so beautiful. And then I just, I've used shadows before and done things, paintings, but mostly charcoal paint uh, drawings about shadows and just letting them lead me. And I, I wanted to have a hopeful painting, something that that we're looking through this period, maybe a dark period, but there's something luminous, something that is reflective of a change. And this one may look extremely different, but I started this before COVID and it was something that I had worked on the thought of it for a long time. I saw this image in the New York Times and it was about the Big Bang when they finally were able to record that first initial burst of energy. And what I did was study the, the lines and where the lines moved and changed because I'm really interested in energy. It's like the energy of that paintbrush, right? It's that form that changes when it, it hits something else and then it veers off and something else happens, so cause and effect. So I did a series of drawings based on that where I, I really studied the forms and how they matriculated across the page. And after I did that, then I started on the background, which I use a lot of translucent glazing. Uh, I like glazing because the glazing is thin, thinned out oil paint. And when you do that, you can create a surface that has depth. And you and what happens is that there's this interchange between what is underneath and what you're putting on top. And so you get all these really, really subtle things going on. And you can actually look into the painting and see these layers if there's a lot of them in there. So this was the, the part that was first and then I put down the lines that you see. And when I came back after I could get in my studio, I put the lines. And yes, it's very OCD. I really appreciate that <laughs> the observation. I'm sure one of you has made it. But what happened was it became pacifying to me that there was so much going on politically in our world and also just with the fear of COVID and just doing lines and thinking about, well, where did this one come from? And where did that one come from? And what kind of interchange, what kind of a beautiful uh, empty space is created by those crossing of lines? So I, I, I just did that day after day, listening to my son's music on mixed cloud and just enjoying myself. And it was, it was very healing for me. At the same time, I did clay. And I was also thinking about that mark, that shape, what happens when something hits another thing and what is, what causes, what is, what, what happens from that interchange. And so this happened between those two things. And at the same time, I was interested um, reading about the brain and reading about a beautiful brain by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And he was a Nobel winner and he looked at the brain cells on slides in early microscopes and he was an artist. So he did these incredible drawings 
And I just really fell in love with it. And it's this, and also I found this book, I think at the same bookstore actually in St. Louis. And this is by another Nobel Prize winner, but somebody contemporary. And Eric Handel is really a great neuroscientist who is also an art lover. And he connects the idea of how we perceive, how our perception and how our brain works to perceive. And what I got from him was that there is a way of looking at, at art in two ways. And if you're looking at a piece that's say a landscape or a, or a still life, your brain is looking from, they call it bottom up. It's because we have a lot of reference points. We know that's a landscape. We know that's a face. But if you take something like, um, let's say a Helen Frankenthaler or a Mildred Thomas or a Lee Krasner or a Rothko or a Pollock, where there's no landscape, there's no horizon line, there's nothing to, to ground you in, in I know what that is. And so what happens as a result of that is that your brain seeks understanding and puts its own meaning into it via your memories, via your feelings, via things that you construct internally. And that really interests me as an artist. How, how, to, I, how can I engage you as a viewer? Because without you, this is just me doing something. And I, I feel that it's really necessary to know that I can engage other people in, in thinking and understanding and searching. So this was the painting that came out of it. It's squash and watercolor. It's called Connections. I did it in 2021. It's 30 by 23. And I did it so that trying to put those ideas of Kendall and, and Santiago together so that you have that openness, you go into the painting at the top and you descend into it. And then there's all this complexity and I've thought of it in other ways, because besides practicing painting, I also practice meditation. And I think about it. Sometimes my head is like down here and it's got all these connections, all these thoughts, all these constructions of the mind. And then as I relax, then I can come up to a more open space. Also there, I did, um, a study of yin and yang, and this is yin, and this is yang. So I was thinking about how life comes in and life goes out, or how there is this constant uh, movement. It's always moving between something coming in or something going out, and you know, there's many mythologies about that. But I just wanted to experience it myself, you know, through the paint. And so that's what these are about. This is uh, sort of on the same line. There's, there's, I've been doing ceramics at Parkland through um, uh, classes with Chris Birdie. And one of the things that I've really wanted to do is think about how can I do clay the way I paint? So can I create something so that I can respond to it? So instead of taking a, a slab of, of clay and, and making it, letting it dry, so then I can mold it over, say a tube and it'll stay in that tube form. I actually take it when it's still moist, wrap it around that tube and let it, and, and connect it together, but then let it, form its own form and then work with it and then respond to how that happened. That interests me more. And I'm going to skip ahead. Lisa, how am I doing on time? Okay. So you're too, I'm sorry, you're doing well. I, you know, I talked a little bit earlier, so I think you've got about three more minutes. Okay. So I'll do a quick one on this. Um, weaving has been sort of a standing thread, <laughs> to make a pun, in my work. And 
This one is called Light in the Darkness. It was also, you know, that sort of metaphor of, of both things existing simultaneously that I play with. And this is an earlier piece called Hope where I'm still, I'm also playing with that duality. This is a large piece, it's four by four foot. And then I was doing small things with wire drawings, I call them, I've done probably 45 or 50 of them where I take wire and these are four by six inches. So that's another warp in dimension. But I, in it, I'm trying to explore in, uh, impermanence. And those same kind of weavings take place in sometimes in my Ikebana that I really enjoy working with my teacher, uh, um, Kamiko Gunji. And I made the piece down below that uh, soapstone and the, the wooden pieces that I've woven together. So I'll just quickly go through the last ones. These are earlier pieces, river. And this is water after I went to India. This is called We Are All Connected. It's also after I went to India. And this is the last piece I'm going to show. It's my uh, a heart shield that I did in the 80s. And I was visiting with my sister recently, and it's in her kitchen. And I have always loved this piece. And I think that it really represents, it's still what I'm doing. It's still those lines. It's still those creating shapes and playing off of each other. So I, I found this recently, Annie Albers quote that I just thought is so good. Art is something that makes you breathe with a different kind of happiness. So I leave you with that. Thank you so much. <laughs>